What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas, joined by Noah, a.k.a. FB God on Twitter. It's Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. I don't remember if I already said that, but we're going to say it again. Today, we are jumping into the top quarterback and tight end sleepers, an early look at the top sleepers for 2019 fantasy football. We hit up the running backs. We hit up the wide receivers. We will link that up there and down below. Those are good episodes, so check them out if you missed them. Today is strictly about the throwers and – the big boy catchers. Some of the wide receivers are big, but we're going to stick to tight ends for, for this um, for this thing. Let me minimize all the other apps I got floating around over here so we can give you our full attention. So Noah's here with us, as I said. He's going to be uh, hopping on during the summer every Tuesday. He's going to be taking over that show. He's going to be telling me what content we're pushing out, and I'm just going to come here and provide the big facts for you. So in the comments section down below, let Noah know all the things that he's doing wrong so he can fix them and get better and – Maybe one day, one day, take me over as the big dog king. But what's going on, Noah? How are you, my man? I'm doing all right. Hopefully, there's a character count on YouTube so you guys don't read me too hard. But <laughs> <laughs> it might take a little uh, adjusting, editing these videos. I used to be a savant back when I was like 11, putting up Gangnam style shit. But, you know. You got any, uh, you got any links to those? Are they still up on the web? <laughs> Somewhere. But I don't know. They're probably buried real deep. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be happy if anybody found them. Someone go, someone after you watch this video, type in the YouTube bar, Noah, Noah Pyers, FB God. <laughs> I wonder if you call did you call yourself FB God at the time? No, I don't even know why. Low key thought of yourself as the God. <laughs> I don't even know why I made this. I didn't even think I'd like get that many followers. I'm like, yeah, I'll just throw up a name real quick. And then Bro, I'm going to, you're going to have, <laughs> you're going to have probably like 2000 Twitter followers by the end of the summer, I think. Dude, I have like somewhere like 500 people keep following me and i just put out like the dumbest shit and it's like i don't know maybe it's working it is working you're <laughs> under my wing now and we're ready to roll so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna actually give y'all some value um so noah's actually on, on spring break right now in college and he wanted to go on vacation i said fuck no we got things to handle right now he wants to be on the beach he wants to be in mexico but we need to talk about sleepers for y'all I will start it off. We'll, we'll start with the quarterbacks first. And we actually didn't organize this, so we might end up having some of the same players on the list so we can kind of just bounce off each other. First guy on my list is Dak Prescott. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I'm going to put the, the cliche plug at the front of this video letting you know, obviously, you're going to know all these names. There's only 32 fucking quarterbacks in the league. I'm not going <laughs> to be able to tell you a quarterback that you don't already know. So enough with the these aren't sleeper guys. Dak Prescott is being drafted right now as quarterback 17 per draft.com. 121st overall. He finished last year as QB 10. He had that amazing rookie season, but it's kind of been a roller coaster uh, of the last couple of years in terms of what you're getting from Dak Prescott from fantasy, uh, a fantasy perspective. But I think the way the year ended for Dak uh, really, you know, made me high on him. And I, I love to see what he did down the stretch. And I think it was mainly due to the addition of Amari Cooper on the outside. And when you take a look at these splits, uh, the last nine games of the season is when he had Amari Cooper playing with him on, on the Cowboys after they traded for him. And you see the numbers, uh, the completions are up, the pass attempts are up. They went more pass heavy because they had people to throw to. His fantasy points per game were far up, interceptions lower. Everything was was way, 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 way better. Um, and again, he finished, the, he finished the season as quarterback 10. Um, but over the second half of the season, the final eight games of the season, Dak was quarterback three in fantasy, only behind Patrick Mahomes and big Ben and that includes that week 17 game where he threw like eight passes and he barely played in um so if he plays in week 17 and puts up like 20 fantasy points he's actually your quarterback one over the second half of the year so don't let Dak sneak by you because he had a very 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 sneaky strong end uh end to the year last year and if you look at that offense right one of the things that you loved about Dak was that offensive line and they were banged up for a lot of the uh, a lot of the season, they had guys that you know went on the IR early and never came back. Some of their Pro Bowl players, um, and they just dealt with injuries throughout. And you would assume, you know, coming into this year, that they will be fully healthy, hopefully. And if they are, I think that's just more of a bigger boost. We have Jason Witten coming back to the field. I don't know what that means for uh, <laughs> Dak Prescott, <laughs> if anything. I mean, they already say they're going to be giving him twenty five snaps or twenty five percent of the snaps a game. I don't know how the fuck they know that in March, but if anything. It's not a negative thing. Maybe maybe like two of the times that they're on the goal line, right? Maybe two times of the 100 times they're on the goal line, they say, hey, you know what? We're going to run a pass play for Jason Witten instead of 
uh, running it with Zeke up the middle. Who knows if that's going to happen, but I can't see this as a negative. If anything, there could be a slight boost for there. So, you know, Dak might not be flashy, but he's a guy who gives you the rushing floor. He's had about 300 rushing yards and six rushing touchdowns in every season so far since he's came in the league. Love what we saw over the second half of the year. I just think this Dallas Cowboys offense is in for uh, a nice bounce back. So at quarterback 17, I will be taking Dak all day and tomorrow. And that's it. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I I think that they're actually have a good chance of drafting receiver in this class. Because if you look at their defense, they're pretty solid all around. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think they just signed uh, Demarcus Lawrence again. Their offensive line, as you said, is like really good. They're good at run blocking, pass blocking. And they don't need a running back, obviously. Tight end, they're a little thin, so they might, I mean, move up or something and try to get Noah Fant. But there's a ton of really good receivers in this class. They just lost Cole Beasley, I think. So if they can replace him with a guy they like signed, Greg. They, they signed Randall Cobb. Huh? All they right. signed Randall Cobb a couple of days ago. Only. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, I mean, if anything, I mean, that's, that's, that's a nice yeah. little safety valve for, um, for Dak. If he could stay on the field, who knows. But, yeah, dude, if they draft – I think Noah Fant, I, I think the Seahawks are going to end up taking the tight end, one of these top tight ends in the first round at pick 21. But if the Cowboys end up doing that, um, I'll, I'll, be all, I'll be all in on Dak. Yeah, I think the Seahawks might just take another running back, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah, but actually, Randall Cobb would probably be better than drafting a rookie receiver because he doesn't need to adjust to the league since he's already been playing, you know. And Michael yeah, Gallup, right. towards the end of the season, showed a lot of flashes. He's, like, very good vertically. Not hey, like hey, 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 hey. We're fading the word flash. We're fading the word flash from now on, all right? All right. <laughs> I don't want to hear he showed flashes. I want consistency over a long period of time. Right. That's what we want. I'm pretty sure he saw somewhere upwards of like five and a half targets a game over the second half of the season, and he did produce uh, – I'm not going to say flashes, but there were times at the goal line where he like elevates really well, and I could see the combination of him and Cooper uh, both on the outside uh, working to Dak's benefit as he did in the second half of the season. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, too, with Witten. I know I was, like, joking about it, and I'm like, ah, maybe they end up throwing some more red zone looks or on the goal line pass that way. But Cooper has always been a miserable fucking target down by the five-yard line, down by the end zone. So if Gallup can, you know, develop into a real red zone threat and, and Witten gets some looks down there, I mean, that's only going to help Dak because Dak's really been working with – since that, uh, Dez has, you know, peaked and left, he's had nothing really to work down uh, work down with there besides Zeke running the ball. So I, I really like Dak there. Who do you got on your, on your list? All right, my first quarterback is Carson Wentz, and I had, like, run a poll earlier, like, somewhere in January about, like, oh, which quarterbacks, like, what's the ranking of quarterbacks, and I set out, like, four different options, and it might have been, like, my fault, like, putting, you're only limited to four options, so I had to put guys like Phillip Rivers, like, Mm -hmm. Mahomes, whatever, so Carson Wentz actually slipped to, I think, quarterback 16, but that's not obviously 100% accurate, so I went to draft.com earlier, and they have him at QB 13 right now, and I know that's not really a sleeper. But that's lower than a QB1, and all he's shown throughout his career is to produce at, like, top 12 numbers. Two years ago, when he was, like, an MVP candidate, I think he only played 11 games. He was just shy of 3,300 yards, put up 33 touchdowns, and sneakily ran for 300 yards. He's, like, very athletic. He can uh, move with his legs. He doesn't score too much with them, but 40 rushing yards is as good as a passing touchdown. Uh, He put up 21.8 fantasy points a game that year, which this year there were a ton of, like, crazy quarterbacks like Patrick Mahomes and Luck. We're putting up astronomical numbers, but those numbers still would have ranked him as the QB3 this year. And if you look at last season and the limited sample that he had, he, he was on pace to put up 4,471 yards, 31 touchdowns, a little less rushing yards, but he's coming off an ACL. And keep in mind, he was playing with like a broken back or whatever the entire season. Yep. He came back early. He left early. And, I mean, it's kind of tough to be the starting quarterback when every time you go in the locker room, you see Big Dick Nick just swinging that thing around. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm not sure how much confidence your team's going to have in you when you're not the alpha, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, all in, I'm all in on Wentz as well. I like both these NFC East quarterbacks. Um, I actually have a lot of notes on Wentz, not for this article, but I had started writing, um, you know, bounce back players for 2019. And Carson Wentz was the first guy that popped into my head. And like you said, it's like not having BDN in the locker room. I think there was a lot of like mental, um, mental mud in, in Wentz's head between coming back from the injury – having foals there, uh, just a lot of, of, of mess there. And now he's coming into the season, you know, he doesn't have to compete with Nick Foles. Not that he was, you know, in a competition for starting quarterback role. Uh, but, you know, he'll be healthy. He's finally, like, removed from this ACL, and this is this is over with. And you're right, like, that's the thing. He did really well on a per-game basis last year. I think people are underestimating just how good he was in the limited time that he played. Um, yeah, I that have, was um, rushing the ball. 
What's that? Yeah, I, I have like a stat that I like went through. Of the 11 games, Facts, he, baby, let's get it. Of the 11 games he played, eight times he finishes top 13 QB. I know that's like it's not a QB one, but it's just there. You're not gonna be mad if your guy's a QB 13 if you're playing him on a fucking bye week for somebody else. That translates to 72.7 percent of the time he was a top 13 QB. You look at other quarterbacks who finished really high. Matt Ryan and Andrew Luck only did it 75 percent of the time. Big Ben did it 56 percent of the time. Deshaun Watson 69 nice percent of the time. So obviously those guys have higher upside and a higher ceiling. But Wentz really has one of the higher floors in the league. And now with all these new weapons getting Deshaun Jackson, even Dallas Godart uh, down by the goal line, he's got a high floor and he really has a high ceiling if he can get those rushing numbers back. Yeah, I think he has a massive ceiling. And I was looking because, you know, they wanted to kind of take away his running game from him just to, you know, reserve his health and make sure he was there for the long run. And I looked at like, okay, so the last five games of 2018 – uh, Wentz's individual game rushing numbers, negative three yards, negative four, negative two, six, and seven. The last five games of 2017, rushing yards total, 16, 30, 29, 18, and eight. So in a year where he was still, you know, like you said, points per game, top five fantasy quarterback, uh, he, he was, he, that didn't even include like those extra two to three points on the floor of where he's putting those rushing totals. And, and the Deshaun Jackson thing is really, I wrote this article about Wentz prior to them even signing Deshaun Jackson. And now it's like anywhere Deshaun Jackson goes where he touches the quarterback, it's absolute gold. You know what I mean? Cause it's not like, I'm not like all in on Deshaun Jackson being a fantasy player. I, I saw somewhere, someone tweeted out that the odds Vegas put um, Deshaun Jackson's yardage odds at 900 and a half this year. So they think he's going to break 900. I would, I would take the under on that, but I mean, just the fact that they put it there is like, I mean, that, that's such, that's, that's so much icing on the cake for Wentz. So I'm all in on Wentz. I, I could, I absolutely see him flirting with like top five fantasy quarterback numbers. So if he actually falls outside the top 12, he will be like my top late round target at quarterback. Yeah. And just building off that DJX point, I looked up, he was on, or Carson Wentz was on pace to throw the 11th most deep balls last year but he only threw three touchdowns on deep passes, whereas the year prior, he threw 10 in a limited sample. So with yeah, DJX stretching really high, He had that really high touchdown rate his rookie year, and everyone mm-hmm. was like, you yeah, know, that has to come down. But I still think his, you know, it, it was like at 7.5, and that's that's too high to, to be consistent year over year. But I think, like, I think he's a career, like, 5% kind of touchdown thrower. Um, mm-hmm. and you just look at this Eagles offense. They're always very – under Doug Peterson, they're always very, very high – passing volume they don't have running backs they don't want to run the ball 35 times a game they like to pass the ball and Wentz you know him getting out of the pocket again him him being mobile again is only going to be like amazing with the connection between Deshaun Jackson getting open downfield so I'm all in on Wentz Mm -hmm. um do you have any other I know you have a couple more quarterbacks on the list right yeah piss me off just do it do it (laughs) I left I, (laughs) I left Josh Allen out the thing is, I was going to do Josh Allen, but there were, like, no big facts to support him other than <laughs> me liking him, so I couldn't come in here just bullshitting. So the next guy I got is Derek Carr, and I, I'm not, like, a fan of him in real life, but it's hard to deny that he has, like, a much improved receiving core. They lost mm-hmm. Jordy Nelson and Jared Cook. Those guys should be in nursing homes anyways. But they got <laughs> Antonio Brown, who's – he wins in all facets of the game, all, all levels of the field. Tyrell Williams, as a Chargers fan, it hurt to see him go. Uh, he works well, like down the sideline. He's he uh, he had one of the higher uh, contested catch rates last year. I think it was somewhere like sixty eight percent. So he could be used in like intermediate games or just jump balls. Yep. Uh, and they even signed JJ Nelson, who isn't a big name guy, but he runs like a four two nine or something crazy like that, just yes. to stretch the field. And then out of the backfield, they have Jalen Rashard, mostly on third downs, but. He just really has weapons all over the place. And if you remember just two years ago, the guy was like an MVP candidate. He had back-to-back 3,900-yard seasons and 28 and 32 touchdown uh, pass touchdowns. And that's when he had Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree. Ever since then, he's been left like Amari Cooper and fucking Seth Roberts. <laughs> As we all know, Amari Cooper wasn't doing jack shit like two years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, now he's got an upgraded uh, upgraded receiving court. And the one thing I really look for in these sleeper quarterbacks is one, do they have people to throw to? And number two, their defense. And I love the Oakland defense because they suck. They gave up a ton of points. <laughs> Last year, they allowed like 29 points a game. And that means you're just going to have to throw. And at least four times next season, they're going to be playing from behind, playing against the Chargers and the Chiefs. Those are both like high-powered offenses. He's going to have to throw the ball. They don't really have any running backs. I'm not sure what's going on with Marshawn Lynch. The other guy's Doug Martin. So, I don't know. John Gruden's just collecting all the pieces that are over 35 years old. 
So I think there's no way that he, yeah, there's no way that they don't pass at least like 62% of the time, which would land them easily inside the top 10. And with these weapons, I don't know. He's not going to be like a rock solid QB one, but he'll definitely be a guy you can pick up off waivers, uh, plug and play and uh, good matchups or even in uh, bye weeks for other quarterbacks. Yeah, Carr was a guy that I was planning on completely fading this year. Um, I knew there would be people that got kind of high on him, but what they've done with the offensive pieces is free agency have definitely interested me a little bit. Like you said, I mean, they they have three legitimate field stretchers now. They have J.J. Nelson, like you said, like a, a sub-4, 340. Terrell Williams, for the for the size that he has, is, I believe, sub-4, 5. He's like 4, 4, 8 guy. Four, four, eight, yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he play, his game is, is semi-similar. He's a, a much less polished version of A.J. Green where you could throw it up, let him make athletic plays. Uh, so I like Tyrell and then obviously Antonio Brown. So it's like, you know, these these mediocre quarterbacks, the ones that fall in the middle of the of the pack, I, I always say this, are usually in fantasy just going to be as good as the weapons around them. So you put these pieces around. They You're, you're right with Jalen, uh, Jalen Richard. I'm not even sure, like, if he's, he's still under contract, I'm assuming. Probably. Um, I have no clue. They throw, yeah, they throw the ball a lot. Like, under Gruden's offense has always been one that passes the ball a ton. They don't have a lot of success running the ball on the ground, and they pass at a high percentage. The one thing I will say, I, I kind of feel like the bad defense thing is – not necessarily a myth because you do have to pass at a higher percentage, but the volume is not there. Like if you think about it, it's like the defense is bad, but that also means that the other offense kills a lot of clock because they always have the ball, you know? So I think people like to look at that, those like garbage time stats or like to look at, Oh, the defense is bad. So they're always going to have to pass the ball. It's like, yes, but they're also not going to have the ball that much, you know? So it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see what happens in Oakland. Um, I am getting on board with, with Derek Carr. I probably am not, I'm not going to be banking on him as like my, my second quarterback in super flex, but I will probably grab him as like the QB three in a super flex league. And, you know, if he starts kind of popping off, like you said, against like a Kansas city team, I would probably throw him into my lineup because there will be a lot of points scored. So I like Derek Carr. Um, one guy I like is Matt Stafford. I like Stafford a lot. You know, he had his first down year for fantasy purposes last year um, for the first time in a while. I think that's going to happen when, one, you get rid of his his favorite weapon for the last four years, Golden Tate. Marvin Jones played in half the season. He was out. Um, they didn't really have a running game. Beside the, I mean, they're feeding fucking LeGarrette Blunt the ball as much as they were <laughs> Karrion Johnson. Karrion Johnson w- looked like he was about to take over as a workhorse there and then he got hurt right so you look back at you know coming into 2018 I like Matt Stafford a lot as a late round quarterback and I just think of like why why was that and I'm like oh because they were building up their offensive line they were building up these weapons um and and they still have a very good offensive line I think it went under the rug only because the team struggled so bad but they still ranked I think top eight in pass blocking for both PFF and football outsiders so you're going if you're unbiased and you don't look at last year's number you're going into the season. You're like, Matt Stafford has put up, you know, like eight consecutive 4,400-yard seasons prior to last year. They have a top eight pass blocking line. Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones now can take back over the wide receiver two role, right? He doesn't have to be the alpha there. He doesn't have to go up against cornerback ones because they have Kenny Galladay. I think low-key, the signing of Danny Amendola in the slot was going to be a great signing there for football purposes. Um, Jesse James is a great blocker. They, they added him. I don't know what he's going to do contributing in the passing game. He's like and they're six, all kind of, seven, too, so that could help. Yeah, uh, the the red zone. Him in the red zone, definitely. And Carrion Johnson will be back healthy. So I think this offense is going to be heavily, heavily slept on because of recency bias. Um, so I like Matt Stafford to take a, a bounce back now. Yeah, I agree with, like, all those points. If you look before last year, he was, like, consistently in or around the QB1 range. And yep. I'm not sure if you mentioned where he's being drafted, but I highly doubt it's anywhere near, like, top 12 QB just because people when they see guys like fall down a little bit they don't even like look at the scenario that happened they just automatically write them off the next season Mm -hmm. Matt Stafford's getting paid big bucks and he's got receivers all over the place and as you mentioned Kerryon Johnson's like a very good pass catcher and the fact that he was out last year meaning LeGarrette Blount was playing uh like first and second downs the most time that means like he doesn't have anybody throw to really out of the backfield next year with Kerryon Johnson on first and second downs he'll at least have a weapon back there and then even yes. on third downs with Riddick. Yeah, exactly. And, like, that's the other thing. It's like Golden Tate left. They put in Bruce Ellington. He got hurt. Like, they had no – he had no <laughs> pass catchers to work with. It was just Kenny Galladay getting triple, double teamed by safeties and cornerbacks. Guess where – guess what quarterback Matt Stafford is being drafted as right now on draft? 21. Higher as in, like, a better quarterback? Or like, a bigger number. A bigger number. <laughs> uh, 25. All right, fuck that. <laughs> 26. Quarterback 26. The fact that he is quarterback 26 right now is fucking criminal. So I love Matt Stafford there. I've been I've been grabbing as my quarterback three, quarterback two in, in best ball leagues a lot. 
Um, I also like, you know, off topic, but Marvin Jones as a, mm-hmm. uh, as a bounce back player. So you got any more quarterbacks on the list? I think that was the last of mine. No, just saying uh, one other guy I didn't really do any research on, but Josh Rosen, it can't get any worse than it was last year. And bringing in Cliff He was on my list. He was on my list, but I don't, I don't want to talk about him until the NFL draft goes mm-hmm. by and we know either where he is or if they did or didn't draft Kyler Murray. So yeah. we'll get into him afterwards. I like Sam Darnold as well. He was like um, – I think he was like the – had the highest quarterback rating over the last month of the season. They're slowly putting pieces around him. Um, you know, between Le'Veon Bell out of the backfield, which I think is going to be huge for Darnold as like a developing quarterback. Crowder in the slot. We saw Darnold target the slot uh, on a huge number of uh, his passes last year. The percentages were so high, which is why I got excited about a guy like Quincy Nunwa in the beginning of the season because he was running from the slot. But now, you know, they put him and Robbie Anderson outside. Um, so Sam Darnold, I didn't dive too deep into, but he's absolutely someone who has like sleeper breakout potential. Let's dive into uh, the tight ends, though. What do you got for me? All right, my number one tight end. Uh, for the year as well as this video is Ian Thomas he's currently be dra- being drafted as tight end number 22 and last year he was a rookie and you uh, typically rookies don't really produce to start off their career and we saw that early on when Greg Olson got injured I think it was probably four or five games everybody was picking up Ian Thomas thinking he was going to be like an automatic plug and play he mm-hmm. didn't do much at all and then Olson went down again with another injury later in the season and over the last five weeks of the uh, the year, Ian Thomas finishes a top twelve quarterback four times, and tight just end. look, uh, yeah, tight end. All right, uh, just stupid motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just looking at Greg Olson, he's thirty four. He's had back to back years with uh, season ending injuries. He's had three foot injuries in the past two years. I believe one was a Jones fracture. People don't typically come back from that, and I think he was like flirting with becoming like a broadcaster. I think so he still I, is, to be honest. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd like. I don't like banking on injuries for somebody to break out, but if there's somebody I'm going to do it for, it's Greg Olson. I mean, I'm not sure he has much tread left on those tires. And yeah, he got hurt like seven times last year. Yeah. So. Along with that, Devin Funches is now gone, opening up 12 red zone targets, six end zone targets, and ten looks in, or six looks inside the 10-yard line. And as we all know, Cam Newton utilizes his tight end very heavily. He threw to them in the red zone 15 times. And with him like being the only big-bodied receiver that they have, assuming – you know, Greg Olson doesn't stick around the entire year. He's probably going to dominate a lot of those looks inside the 20 and inside the 10. And he's also very good in contested catch situations. I was looking up his numbers. It's somewhere in like the 80, like 80% of the contested balls thrown his way. He caught, it was on a small sample, but you know, overall he's just a very good 85.7%. Yeah. I'm looking at that right now. Yeah. Overall, he's just like a very good receiver. He's athletic. He's young. Uh, he showed a good rapport with Cam Newton and even that other white quarterback they had, like Heineken or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Taylor Henke or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then didn't they have somebody else? Oh, whatever. Um, yeah, he yeah, had his – Christian McCaffrey, I'm pretty sure. Was <laughs> yeah, sure. he threw a dot to some, like, 300-pound tight end. Yeah, sure. But, uh, uh, we also know that Cam Newton's shoulder isn't – doing too well and i just saw a report that he's like not having sex for the next month so he's dude, i saw that and i'm like if i'm the gm of the panthers and i'm seeing these reports surface i'm like dude cam you're a fucking psycho like what are you doing dude he's also a vegan so he's doing like all this junk science well, shit. So he's a vegan and a virgin what the <laughs> <laughs> double v the flying v <laughs> the flying v cam new the flying v <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so i'm not sure the shoulders ever gonna get better with all this shit he's doing uh, and I looked up his intended air yards, which means like how far he meant to throw the ball, which was at 7.1. And Ian Thomas's av- average depth of target was 6.1. So he works a lot in the shorter area of the field. And Cam Newton's not one to really throw deep, especially with his shoulder. Obviously, yeah. that number could go up if he gets any better. But he's working and he's operating in like an area of the field where Cam Newton is proficient in. And the team doesn't uh, throw all too much. But for tight ends, you're just hoping for a touchdown or like 50 yards. So I'm yeah. not too concerned about that. My biggest concern with Ian Thomas, and I'm with you, he, he's one of my guys. I'll have him much higher in dynasty than I will in season long because just Greg Olson being there scares me. I, I would almost pencil Greg Olson in for missing six games, if not more than that, um, with the 19-foot injuries he had. I don't even know if he's actually going to be back in 2019, so we'll have to see. But Ian Thomas is a guy who has like a 70th percentile um, speed score, 83rd percentile burst score. His agility score is in the 77th percentile. So he is a very, very good athlete. And like you said, over the last, like, five weeks of the season, uh, he, had, he had stat lines of, like, 9 for 77, 4 for 48, 5 for 61 in a touchdown. 
Um, so he, he had games where he looked really good for like a five-week stretch at a time. And if something were to happen to Greg Olson, of course, you know, Ian Thomas is the first guy to step up without Funches. That was a really good point. I didn't even, uh, I didn't really even think about that, but Cam Newton is, is my biggest concern for that entire passing offense. But I like the fact that he'll have a lot more time to kind of recover from, you know, the shoulder surgery than he did the previous time. They really rushed him back in last year. So I think he'll be a little healthier. Um, I, I wish I had asked Dr. Jesse Morse about, uh, Cam Newton on on the episode that was out last Friday. If you guys missed that one, we talked about all the injured running backs from last year um, and what their outlooks for 2019 are. We're going to do a separate video talking about just wide receivers. That one is just running backs. I'll ask him about Cam in the next video we do together. Um, So make sure you check that out. But uh, I I like Ian Thomas a lot. My my concern is though that if Greg Olson like is is active on any game day, it's going to cut Ian Thomas's snap counts down to 50, and he's not going to become a reliable. reliable you know every week starter for season long and that's like the same thing with Dallas Goddard is, is like uh you know as long as Zach Ertz there like you can be excited about Dallas Goddard in in dynasty but realistically you're not gonna be able to put him in your lineup for another like two years so it's like it's kind of annoying but I mean I, I definitely am, am on board with Ian Thomas there yeah where he is right now he's not even really getting drafted so you could probably just wait until Greg Olson gets hurt or like just stash him at the end of your bench as like yeah as you'll likely be able to get him on the wire um yeah. And then, I mean, there's a couple of guys going in, in like semi the top 10 right now um, after. So right now the ADPs for tight ends on draft is, is Travis Kelsey, Zach Ertz, George Kittle, Eric Ebron. So those three are all within the top 25. Then there's like a 30 pick drop off Eric Ebron, OJ Howard and Evan Ingram and Hunter Henry are all like kind of within like six or seven picks. Um, David Njoku has to take a little bit of a backseat now with OBJ there. Then right after that, there's two guys that really interest me. It's Vance McDonald and it's Jared Cook. Um, now, obviously, they're not sleepers in, in the sense that, you know, you don't really know much about them. But Vance McDonald's is in, in a beautiful situation with Antonio Brown's 169 targets gone. Uh, Jesse James, who he was splitting snaps with, is gone. And Vance McDonald finished as a tight end 10 last year in fantasy. And this was with those other weapons there. There's like 250 targets up for grabs in that offense. Vance McDonald had games where he blew up, and he's one of the most athletic tight ends just from a metric standpoint there. So Vance McDonald is a guy – that you can pick outside of the top five, that's probably the most likely to finish in the top five. Jared Cook, I was all off of because he finished, you know, high last year. Then I was like, you know, he's not going to do that again this year. What are your thoughts on Jared Cook landing in New Orleans? The thing about New Orleans is they like to throw the ball, and especially with Mark Ingram gone, I think they move a little bit more towards the pass this year. Um, if you look at their weapons, I mean – Traquan Smith is obviously their third, well, before the Jared Cook signing, but he wasn't anything consistent at all last year. No. Uh, obviously, Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara are going to eat up a lot of targets, but right now, unless I'm forgetting somebody, Jared Cook is really the third option, and being tethered to Drew Brees, I mean, that's that's not a bad quarterback to have as a, like, be a third option for. Yeah, they have, um, I, I believe they matched whatever offer sheet they needed to for Cameron Meredith, but he was, yeah. you know, he, who knows if he'll ever even get on the field with them this year. Um, and then they have Ted Ginn, which I also don't know yeah. <laughs> what his contract situation is. So it's like, yeah, it's like that third receiver, like that third target for Drew Brees is definitely um, up for grabs. And, I mean, they did bring in Latavius Murray. So, honestly, I could see them doing just as much in the ground as they did last year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like people are going to get a little bit too high on Jared Cook. Like, they're, they're going to see him in New Orleans and see Drew Brees and remember what Jimmy Graham did there a while back and be like, okay, you know what, I could fade the top five, six tight ends, and Jared Cook's going to put up tight end one numbers for me. And, like, I I think it's possible, but I'm not someone who wants to bank on that. Like, are you going to be drafting Jared Cook anywhere as your tight end one in, like, a season-long league? No, I wouldn't. I'm not even sure if I'm going to touch Jared Cook just because the guy broke out when he was, like, 32 years old. Obviously, he falls, like, to tight end 15. I'll take a chance. I'm not saying he's not going to break out or anything or not be a good player, but – there's a lot of guys like in and around his area. Like you said, Vance McDonald. I think he just – he probably has a little more opportunity because Big Ben loves to throw the ball, and he actually showed that he can use Vance McDonald. We're not sure yet if Jared Cook is going to be like – if Drew Brees is going to like match up well with Jared Cook. I know that sounds kind of stupid, but at least Vance McDonald has experience with the offense he's in right now. Yeah, and it's like, you know, down by the red zone, down by the end zone where you need your tight end to produce, they have so many weapons there. They're going to use Murray on the goal line. They're going to use Michael Thomas on fades. They're going to use Alvin Kamara in the passing game like crazy. So it's like, how many touchdown opportunities is Jared Cook going to get? And he had like a 19% target share in Oakland last year. And that was like top five amongst tight ends. I can't imagine that he's going to see 
anywhere near, you know, 19 or 20 percent of the targets in, in New Orleans. So I think like I think people are going to get super hyped about him. He's going to get a lot of buzz, but then he needs to kind of settle back down. But it is intriguing because I, you know, originally I was like, stay away from Jared Cook unless he lands in New England or New Orleans. And now he's in New Orleans. So he's definitely back on the map. Um do you have any other like tight ends uh, to watch? I have one more I want to get to, but I'm, I want to see what you got on your list. Yeah, I just had Jack Doyle just because he's being drafted as the tight end 19, and I think every time he's love been, Jackie. <laughs> every time he's on the field, he just shows that like he's a very consistent PPR option. Obviously, for like uh, standard leagues, he's not going to be the biggest touchdown threat. But last year, he was targeted in the red zone every game he played, albeit on a small sample. And just two years ago, with Jacoby Brissett, he caught 80 balls. The guy's a target hog, and he's always on the field because he can run block, he can pass block. And if he were to be paced out to a full season, he would have played the seventh most snaps among tight ends, only behind Ertz, Kittle, Gronk, Kelsey, Rudolph, and surprisingly Tyler Higby. But he's not uh, a sleeper in the sense that you're going to draft him and he's going to be like a top 10 option. But if you want some sort of consistency, maybe like four catches for like 35 yards, it's going to be a lot better than just trying to pick somebody off the waivers who's going to catch – a touchdown every five weeks and you have to guess which one he's going to produce in. Yeah. I mean, they bring Devin Funches in, what kind of scares me. And I, th- I, I'm imagining that they're going to grab another weapon in the draft. I'm not sure how early. Uh, the, the thing that really scares me about Jack Doyle, and he was someone I really liked. And when you look at his per game, you know, usage and his numbers, they're very good. Like they should, they, they're amongst some of the top in the leagues. The problem is it's like, that's been that way for a while. And he's not been able to put together a, a full season with Andrew Luck. So it's like, at some point, I think Indianapolis is going to be like, okay, we have to stop making him such a big part of our game plan because we don't know if he's going to stay healthy. We don't know if he's going to trust him. So, like, I could imagine his snap percentage scaling back from, like, the 70 percentage down to, like, 40 or 50 because they don't want to rely on him as, like, in every game or every down weapon because he hasn't been able to show that consistency. So, I like Jack Doyle as a much later sleeper, maybe in, like, later rounds of, uh, of best ball because, you know, when he was healthy last year, he definitely produced um, – but he, he's definitely got a lot of risk there with Ebron taking over as a top tight end. One guy that I think is super intriguing is Mark Andrews of the Baltimore Ravens. Now, Mark Andrews was a, a rookie last year, and you know they had a crowded tight end uh, tight end group there in Baltimore, and they've had a, a had one for a while. But they've always been an offense that likes to ta- target their tight ends on a high percentage of their passes. And, you know, when Lamar Jackson came in as quarterback, he was like, you know, he was just murdered any wide receiver that was on that team for fantasy purposes. The one guy he consistently kept targeting, though, was Mark Andrews. And Mark Andrews, I was looking into Chris Herndon at first, right? Because I liked him as like a potential sleeper. But then, you know, they went and added Jamison Crowder and Le'Veon Bell. And I'm like, you know, the, the upside for Chris Herndon is like 50 targets, 55 targets, maybe this year. So Chris Herndon got off my list. But when I was looking at him, you know, historically, rookie tight ends don't produce. They don't put up receiving numbers, touchdowns, receptions. Last year, Chris Herndon cracked that 500-yard receiving mark. And I was using the Rotoviz uh, like screener tool or whatever, where you can narrow out a lot of different stats. And over the last 20 years, Chris Herndon was top 12 in receiving yards for a rookie, uh, for a rookie tight end. Like number 12 over the last 20 years with that 500. And ironically, Mark Andrews actually had about 50 more receiving yards than him. So Mark Andrews had like the eighth best rookie tight end season over the last 20 years from a receiving yardage total. So like, I think he's someone that people aren't really looking at enough as a starting tight end there. And he's a guy six, five, 256 pounds. So he has that size. Uh, he ran a four, six, seven, 40, which puts him in the 84th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. He broke out in college. He had a college dominator rating, both above the, uh, the 50th percentile. So I, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things to like here. He was ninth amongst tight ends in air yards last year. Um, and second in yards per target, second in yards per reception, uh, ninth in target separation. So he's a good athlete combined with good production that we saw immediately. And he's someone that I'm, I'm probably trying to buy in dynasty leagues. And he's someone that I think you should definitely look out for in uh, season long leagues because Lamar Jackson showed that, you know, he's a target that he trusted, I guess. And John Brown is gone now. Um, and I'm not sure where the other wide receivers are. Um, I'm not sure about Crabtree, but. I, I think Willie Sneed is an unrestricted free agent, and Michael Crabtree isn't hasn't shown anything. I feel like Willie Sneed might have resigned. I'm gonna have to we're gonna have to fact check that, and I actually feel like Crabtree did not resign with them. But either way, I think there's a lot of targets up for grab. It's gonna be a run first offense, of course. But I think Mark Andrews could put up a very very sneaky good year. 
All right, yeah, I, just, I looked it up. Willie Sneed's unrestricted next year. And as you said, I mean, this offense, when he, uh, when Lamar Jackson took over, I think they ran the ball like over 70% of the time. They just did not want him to throw. And it's not like next year they're going to be – like they're obviously going to be run heavy, but not to that extent. You can't just be that like one-sided on offense. Yeah. And the guy's a Heisman winner. It's not like he can't throw the ball. Um, and also, if you look at their roster, they had like Nick Boyle, Max Williams, Hayden Hurst. And of all those guys, Mark Andrews really separated himself. I don't see him taking a backseat to any of those guys. Most of them aren't even like great pass catchers anyways. And even though they spent a first rounder on Hayden Hurst, he hasn't shown anything. And with Lamar Jackson under center, as you said, I mean, he was on pace to have 700 receiving yards, uh, 23.69 nice uh, yards per catch. So obviously that number is going to come down, but Lamar Jackson showed he wanted to use him. And against the Chargers, I remember he, he got uh, Mark Andrews down the sideline for like a 60 something yard touchdown. And he's very fast in the open field for being that like a big body tight end. So yeah. I really like the upside with his with his athleticism and just the rapport he seemed to build with Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I like I like Mark Andrews as a late round pick. Um, I think uh, I think that's probably the last one on on my list. Um, and just a quick announcement: if you have not heard the uh, the Big Dogs 2019 Fantasy Football Draft Guide is available for pre order right now. In that draft guide will be all of our top sleepers. Um, you know, at each position, our top busts, a big board of 250 overall rankings, standard, half PPR, PPR, dynasty rankings, rookie rankings, ton of good shit in there. So head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com to go check it out and get more info on that. I promise it's your one-stop shop for everything you need for your fantasy football season, bigdogsdraftguide.com. That is it for this video. Make sure that you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we'll be covering everything 2019 fantasy football from here on out every day pretty much for the rest of our lives. No, I hope you are uh, I hope you're okay, okay with that. Committed we to the game. A long yes, sir. <laughs> um so that's it. So make sure you're following us on uh, on Twitter and uh we're out of here. So Noah, I will see y'all whenever the fuck I see you next. All right. See ya. Peace.